I used to teach uh, young adults. I worked in an inner city church in Long Beach, California for about 10 years and taught Bible studies and uh, kind of avoided the book of Revelation. And uh, then eventually there was nothing left. So I kind of had to teach Revelation and I ended up with more questions and answers. So when I decided to go back to school, uh, finish degrees and, uh, and then go to graduate school, uh, at the University of Manchester in England, uh, decided to do the book of Revelation, just to kind of help answer some questions. And uh, ended up, uh, my dissertation got published in 94 on the use of Isaiah and Revelation. And I've done a little bit of other writing on it. Um, but I'm, st I'm still surprised nowadays at, at how much um, misinformation there is about the book of Revelation. Um, you know, maybe a, a lot of what you'll hear this morning sounds kind of new to you, uh, but from, you know, an, an evangelical scholarship kind of perspective, it's not new at all. And uh, you can probably pick up any kind of evangelical commentary, look at the latest Bible introductions to Revelation in translations if you have a study Bible, uh, even looking at some of the most conservative books on hermeneutics or biblical interpretation, um, they all approach Revelation basically the same way, which is, what, which is how I'm going to present it. And, and the problem is, is that in pop culture, uh, people don't hear this stuff. Uh, people just kind of know about Revelation from books like Left Behind and movies like Left Behind, which is about as far away as you can get from the original purpose and intent of the book of Revelation. And this is so pervasive. I just finished teaching a New Testament introduction class for Fuller Online. 25 students, they're seminary students, right? Had to do a little project on Revelation, and half of them had no clue, and then they're coming at it from a, a very futurist kind of perspective, um, and, and they got that from reading Left Behind novels and other kind of pop eschatology kind of things. So, um, so I, I really want to emphasize, you know, this is what I'm going to present to you is not like rocket science here. And the reason for this is very simple. We have more background information, more contemporary documents for the, for the setting of Book of Revelation than we do for any of Paul's letters, by far. I mean, you know, I always have very detailed handouts when I teach so that people can say, well, you know, I can look this up myself or you can be reminded um, because I, just, I, I want you to be able to study this on your, on your own as well. Um, but, the, you know, I could, I could, I have all kinds of, you know, videos I could show or inscriptions from Greek and Roman, uh, you know, era stuff that just helps to illustrate uh, the book of Revelation. And we'll, we'll, I'll use a, a few things today to, to help you kind of get situated with the book. Um, we do need to do a few kind of introductory things before we get into talking about kind of what are the main issues of interpretation. So on your handouts, and if you have a Bible too, it'd be good to follow along. Um, but the book of Revelation has been controversial from the very beginning, okay? So it's not just something new. And if you go to the end of the book of Revelation, in chapter 22, very last section, John, the author, says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to that person the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away that person's share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in the book. Okay, So right, right from the get-go, he knows people aren't going to necessarily accept everything he's, he's got to say. And, uh, and he's already, when you read the book, you can see there's prophetic competition in the churches that he's writing to. There's a prophet, prophetess who he calls Jezebel, it's not a real name, uh, and, and she's teaching in these same churches, and she's teaching things opposite of what he's teaching. And so at the end, he's saying, look, you know, you've got to take this as a whole. You can't just pick and choose. You can't like this part of Revelation and not like this part. And so it's, it's very emphatic here. But, you know, as you go down through history, you can see that the book was very controversial. And so if we, we look at the history of the canon 
and Revelation's place in the canon. Um, in the second century, kind of in the earlier part, um, Revelation was pretty widely accepted uh, as scripture in many areas of the Roman Empire. Um, and then when you get to the third of the fifth century, uh, there were a lot of questions. And uh, there's a, a church historian named Eusebius who writes at the beginning of the fourth century, about 315 or so A.D., and he has a section where he talks about what's the state of the New Testament canon at this time. And he has three different categories, accepted books, rejected books, and then questionable books, right? And so at this stage, there are certain books that are accepted by the wide variety of the churches in that time period. The Gospels, for example, are accepted widely. Um, Paul's letters are accepted widely. And then when you get to the last third of the New Testament, the general epistles, Hebrews, Revelation, those are kind of questionable. Some churches accept them, some churches don't. And Revelation has the dubious distinction of being in all three categories. It's accepted, it's rejected, and it's questioned. Okay? It's the only New Testament book in that category. And, uh, and, and, you know, it's, so it was very controversial to some churches. Matter of fact, there's a council of Laodicea. And if you remember, John writes to the church at Laodicea and doesn't say anything real positive to that church. Well, that church decided that it's not insp inspired, right? John didn't say anything very nice about them. When we get to the Reformation period, um, I'll read you a little bit of Luther's preface. Uh, Luther did not write a commentary on Revelation, but he did write a preface to the book of Revelation. <clears throat> 1522, about this book of the Revelation of John, I leave everyone free to hold his own opinions. I would not have anyone bound to my opinion or judgment. I say what I feel, I miss more than one thing in this book, and it makes me consider it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. For myself, I think it approximates the fourth book of Esdras, which is in the Apocrypha. I can in no way detect that the Holy Spirit produced it. So quite, quite critical. Um, Calvin uh, also had commentaries on, on every book, uh, almost every book of the Bible except the Revelation. There's... Uh, when you, when you look at the, what we call the lectionary, you guys are familiar with lectionaries here? No? Uh, where people say, okay, this is what you should read, right, through the year, these books you should read. If you look at the original King James uh, translation, it has the outline of books you should read through the year. Um, and it kind of, uh, it actually has you read more from the Apocrypha than from the book of Revelation, Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, down through history, it's, it's kind of been very uh, spotty as, as, as far as people's in, in acceptance and interpretation. And the reason for that is um, mainly that people misinterpret it. People use it to, to start little fringe groups, you know, way early in the church or even uh, in our day. I've got a Time magazine here from 1993. It's got this guy's picture on there with an inferno in the back, and it says, Tragedy in Waco. Does anybody remember that? David Koresh, right? Took his name from Cyrus in the Old Testament in Isaiah. And, uh, and it's got a quote here from Revelation on the front, Revelation 6, 8. His name was Death, and Hell followed after him. People like to use this book because they can sometimes make it say anything they want to um, because of the symbolism in the book. So it's important that we understand what are the principles, you know, how do we approach a book like this. In the modern period, you even have very academic, philosophical people, very smart people who read the book of Revelation and just come away and go, what the heck is that, right? Um, E.F. Scott, the book cannot be placed on the same religious level as other New Testament writers. Frederick Nietzsche, the most rabid outburst of vindictiveness in all recorded history. 
Um, C.H. Dodd, he was a New Testament scholar at Manchester where I did my degree uh, years ago. The God of the apocalypse can hardly be recognized as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. D.H. Lawrence, the Judas of the New Testament. Okay, well. Um, authorship, who wrote the book of Revelation? Well, we know his name is what? John, okay. But we don't know exactly who John was. Um, there's some early Christian tradition that this was John the Apostle, um, but we also know there are a lot of Johns in that time period, and John in Revelation doesn't really ever call himself an apostle. He calls himself a prophet. And so if you read you know, New Testament uh, introductions or you read commentaries on Revelation, a lot of scholars don't think it's John the Apostle. Um, it's, it's kind of 50-50. There's a little bit of evidence for it, but uh, internal evidence, if we just look at the internal evidence of the book itself, it seems that he identifies himself as a prophet, and he speaks about the apostles as if they're a separate group that he's not part of. It doesn't really matter uh, what you decide on that as to the interpretation of the book, so we don't really need to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, date of writing, usually there's two uh, options there. One is towards the end of the 60s AD in the period of Nero, and the other one, which is by far the, the most common, would be about 95 or 96 AD during the period of Domitian, um, the Roman emperor. And that's, uh, that's probably what you'll find in, in most commentaries. And there's a good, good reason for that. There's a lot of historical evidence that suggests that. I think I have a, a quote on your sheet there from uh, <clears throat> Irenaeus. Uh, John's apocalyptic vision was seen no very long time since, but almost in our day toward the end of Domitian's reign. So Irenaeus is writing in the second century, and he also has, uh, he's been a disciple of people who have been a disciple of John, so he seems to have some pretty good information on that. So it's, it's not so important who he was, but what he was uh, is much more important. So the next section then, uh, the most important thing really is kind of figuring out what are the literary styles of Revelation, okay? Uh, there's a big emphasis now, uh, and has been for a generation, in understanding, you know, what, what kind of writing are we reading here, Right? What's the literary style of a book? Is it a prophecy? Is it legal material? Is it a history like the book of Acts? Is it a gospel? Uh, these are all genres, right? They're all literary styles. And if, if you know the conventions of the genre, that's, ver that's very important in figuring out what the intention of the writer is. There's a certain kind of agreement between a writer choosing a style and the reader figuring out what the elements of that style is. And so, you know, we, we know that from reading like the newspaper, right? You know when you, when you change mental gears, when you're moving from the first page to the financials, to the sports or whatever, you've learned how to navigate the language and the technical terms. And it's the same thing with, with biblical literature. Um, one of the best books I would recommend on this is How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth um, by Gordon Fee and Douglas Stewart. It's written for lay people. Uh, and it basically just talks about all the different types of writings in the Bible. A yeah, very, very helpful book. Um, and so when we get to Revelation, it's a little bit trickier because it has three different styles of writing. And the first style is it's a letter. So it opens up just like a, a Pauline letter, and it closes like a letter. And the most important thing to know about letters is that letters are what we would call occasional, right? Right? They're written for specific occasions. They're written for certain situations in life. So when Paul writes his letter to the Galatians, right? He's writing to people who live in a certain area of the Roman Empire. They're going through certain specific issues. He wouldn't write the letter to the Galatians to the Corinthians, right? They're going through different things, different time period, different situation. So they're occasional. They're written very specifically for those people who are going through those issues. 
And so, I mean, one of the basic things about biblical interpretation is all of the Bible was written for us, but not, none of the Bible was written to us, right? Very important to keep that in mind. It's written for us, not written to us. It's written to very specific kinds of situations. And so this is really fundamental when you're looking at the book of Revelation because John is writing to very specific kinds of situations. Uh, he's not thinking 2,000 years ahead. He's thinking about his congregations that he's a prophet pastor for, just like Paul would be. And so all the implications of letter writing uh, that go along with Paul's letters would go along with the book of Revelation. So you see that John opens up, right? John to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace to you and peace, just like Paul would write. Um, the second type of, of literary style is revelation is a prophecy. And prophecy in kind of the Old Testament sense, right? Like when you're reading Isaiah or Jeremiah, Ezekiel, uh, when the prophet is about to spew out something from the Lord, what does he say? He introduces with a little phrase, thus says the Lord, right? He's speaking as a mouthpiece for God. And it's the same thing in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation where you have the letters to the seven churches, right? Thus says, and here you have Jesus speaking, Christ speaking through John as a prophet, using what we call the messenger formula, thus says. And so we have these elements of prophecy where Jesus evaluates each church, says, you're doing this good, you're doing this good, yeah, not so good on this, need to work on that just like prophets would do in the Old Testament. And biblical prophecy, this is a very important thing to understand about biblical prophecy. Biblical prophecy is more about seeing behind the present than it is seeing into the future. Okay? The prophet is diagnosing the situation of his readers. And he is speaking to their situation. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets are, 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 are speaking to their generation. Okay? Um, they're not always looking dis distantly into the future. Yes, there are some prophecies that are um, you know, messianic prophecies and some others, but uh, if you read like Fee and Stewart's book on prophecy, they say there's only 5% of biblical prophecy that's still yet to come. Okay. So if you take Amos, for example, Amos is speaking to the northern kingdom of Israel about their sin, and he says, look, if you don't shape up, Assyria is going to come in and destroy you. Twenty years later, Assyria comes in and destroys them, right? Um, that's how prophecy works in the Bible. So John is speaking to people in that time period about their issues and situation. And it's all about accountability, um, there's a quote, I don't think, know if I have this on your sheet, but uh, Eugene Peterson, who, if you're going to pick up any kind of a pastoral commentary on Revelation, um, Eugene Peterson, who's an alumni of Seattle Pacific, um, has a little book called Reverse Thunder. Uh, wonderful little book, uh, lots of insights on each page. Uh, he says, a common way to misunderstand prophecy and especially the prophecy of Revelation, is to suppose that it means prediction. But that is not the biblical use of the word. Prophets are not fortune tellers. The prophet is the person who declares, thus says the Lord. He speaks what God is speaking. He brings God's word into the immediate world of the present, insisting that it be heard here and now. The prophet says that God is speaking now, not yesterday. God is speaking now, not tomorrow. It is not a past word that can be analyzed and then walked away from. It is not a future word that can be fantasized into escapist diversion. It is a personal address now. There are predictive elements in some prophecy and some in Revelation, but they are always in service to the present message. The Bible warns against neurotic interest in the future and escapist fantasy into the future. So a bit of a warning there. 
Um, but the most important part of Revelation is understanding the third type of genre or literary style. And that's Revelation as an apocalypse. And this is where people just are not very familiar with this type of literature, right? When you go on vacation in the summer and you want to read a good book at the beach, uh, you don't normally say, I'm going to go pick up an apocalypse. <laughs> but in this time period from 200 BC to 100 AD, this was a very popular genre, right? I have a book at home about this thick, full of apocalypses, Jewish and Christian apocalypses. And that's what I was reading in college when I should have been listening to my lectures. Um, apocalypse of, of Enoch, the apocalypse of Elijah, the apocalypse of Abraham, the apop apocalypse of Isaac. I mean, the, the Sibylline oracles are just they're, they're one after the other. And when you start reading these, you're in the same strange world as the book of Revelation. And you start to get acclimated to the visions and to the symbolism and to the, the repetition of certain things. And if, if you're not familiar with that and you read Revelation, you go, I don't get it. Well, of course you're not going to get it. You're not, you know, if you're, if you're into mysteries, right, if you're into whodunits, there's a certain uh, expectation that by the time you get to the end of the book, somebody's told you whodunit. And uh, there are these conventions about literature. And so we need to acclimate to that type of literature. And it, it's kind of like, uh, you know, a lot of teens and, and older uh, kids are into vampire literature, right? Uh, Twilight, not, not my genre. Uh, or zombie movies, right? I'm sure not too many of you are into zombie movies, but if you are, right, there's a certain expectation of, of what goes along with that. And that's kind of somehow how, how Revelation seems to people. Uh, it's just very foreign. So there's a couple things then about apocalyptic literature. One is the structure is very different from what we're used to. We're used to things that kind of move linearly from beginning to end, and uh, the narrative kind of moves along in some kind of logical progression. And apocalyptic literature doesn't work that way. Um, it's cyclical. It, it looks at something from a certain angle, then it moves on to something else, and then it might come back to that same topic from a different angle. It's kind of like when you're watching certain uh, movies or certain cinematographers that like to look at a, a situation or a scene from different camera angles, right? And you get a different perspective of that particular theme. And it's the same way with Revelation, is that John will, will present certain themes over and over and over, but use different terminology or just a different way of expressing that. And that can be kind of confusing because we're not used to that. So one example of that, if you, if you have your Bibles... In uh, chapter 6 of Revelation, verses 15 through 17, the kings of the earth, and this is during the seal visions, seven seals, the kings of the earth and the magnets, magnates, not magnets, like, <laughs> um, and generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of the one seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Now here John is using uh, the book of Isaiah, um, a couple of sections of Isaiah, reusing the language of what we call the day of the Lord, uh, the day of judgment, and he's using this idea of a great earthquake or a great cataclysm that occurs on the day of the Lord. In chapter 11, verse 18, The nations raged, your wrath has come, the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets, the saints, and all who fear your, fear your name, both small and great, for destroying those who destroy the earth. Okay, this section begins in verse 15, where the seventh angel blows his trumpet, doo, 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 which is a kind of a, a war symbol, um, 
And, but it's the same wrath of God here. It's not a different wrath of God. It's the same judgment day, but using different kind of descriptors. Uh, chapter 14, if you move ahead, verse 19. So the angel swung his sickle over the earth, gathered the vintage of the earth, threw it in the great winepress of the wrath of God. The winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for a distance of about 200 miles. All right? If you go back to verse 14, you'll see that John is using the image of a harvest, a grape harvest. Um, and uh, in verse 14, it says, I looked, there was a white cloud. Seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, a golden crown on his head, sharp sickle in his hand. He's reaping. It's the wrath of God presented now in a different way using kind of agricultural symbolism. Finally, in chapter 19, verse 15, <clears throat> uh, it starts actually in verse 11. Heaven was open, there's a white horse, its rider is called Faithful and True. Um, Verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress, now he's taking up that earlier, right, vision there, of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name inscribed, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I have students tell me that this is why they get tattoos, because Jesus had a tattoo on his thigh. Okay, well, it is a vision. <laughs> I don't think Jesus went down to the local tattoo parlor. Um, so it's the same wrath of God. It's not four wraths of God. This is all the same event looked at from different perspectives. And people can get confused because they go, well, here Jesus is coming on a white horse. Well, wait a minute. In chapter 14, he's coming on a cloud. I'm really confused. Which one is it? Well, it's not either of them really because it's using symbolism and you have to get behind the symbolism to understand the point, right? Which is something we will talk about. There are multiple images of the church in the book of Revelation. They are called, the church is called lampstand, right? It's presented as an army. It's presented as a temple. Uh, it's presented as two witnesses. It's a woman. It's a bride. It's a city. John is taking up all these former biblical images of the people of God and using them to express his own vision. So these are things that we need to keep in mind. Um, so the other aspect of symbolism to keep in mind find my ah so we're on number two use of symbolic language okay so we start talking about the structure of apocalyptic literature but even more important is the language the symbolic language so on your sheet there it says in understanding the visionary imagery of apocalyptic it's important to recognize that the picture symbols of revelation often communicate fundamental spiritual truths, that the pictures themselves are not meant to be taken as literal descriptions. A vision is not a photograph of reality. John is not a reporter cataloging facts about heaven, angels, or demons. Just because something is seen in a vision does not make it a physical reality in time and space outside of the vision, right? If you think of the book of Genesis, Joseph has these dreams about seven cows, Right? There's not literally seven cows floating around in space somewhere. Peter has a vision in Acts of this cloth that gets let down right, with all these unclean animals in it. There's not literally some cloth floating around in space somewhere. This, these are visions. We have to translate the message of the vision and the symbolism. Um, the imagery of the vision needs to be translated from symbol to substance, from medium to message. Um, so, for example, in Revelation, in chapter 3, to one of the churches, John says, look, if you overcome, if you're a conqueror, I will make you a pillar in the future in the temple of my God. But then when you get to Revelation 22, John actually says, there is no temple in the New Jerusalem, right? It's not literal. 
as Eugene Peterson has noted, there is not a line here that is not rigorously theological. But because we have an unhealthy curiosity, a deficient comprehension, because we're always attracted by the spectacular and the emotional, in the apocalypse, we generally become interested in what is only an envelope. Okay. So what does he mean by that? When you get a letter from someone, the envelope is the medium to deliver the letter, right? And when you get it, you usually do what? You open it, you take the letter out, what do you do with this? Throw it away or recycle it, all right? But what he's saying is what a lot of people do is they focus on this and they throw this away, right? Because apocalypse, an apocalypse, that's the medium for the message, right? And so you have to get behind that to understand what is, what is the message behind that. And so when you read a lot of apocalypses, you have certain categories that are very common in apocalyptic literature, which we'll go through. Um, four main categories. And I don't know why I filled some of these in on your sheet and others I noticed I left out. Um, but the first one is color. So colors in apocalyptic literature are not literal. Um, you don't take the color literally, but what's the symbolism behind the color? And we, we know that, right? What are some colors that we use in symbolic ways? Like what are some examples? White for purity. Red for danger, blood, sacrifice. Yeah, it could have a lot of different meanings, right? Depending on the context. What? Purple. Okay, so what's purple? Royalty. Okay, John actually uses that, right? Purple robes, the woman with purple robes. Um, because it took like a thousand murex shells from the coast of phoenicia to make an ounce of purple dye right, it's a great article in in uh, national geographic on this uh and so only rich people could afford purple right real purple anyway um, and that's the same way it works in in apocalyptic literature um, there's a good example in revelation 19 where john is talking about the the wedding feast um, let us rejoice, 19.7, rejoice and exult, give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, his bride has made herself ready, to her it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. Now other places he talks about it literally as white linen, right? Um, and then some of your translations will actually have a little parenthesis here, right? For the fine linen stands for the righteous deeds of the saints, okay? Now, you wish John would kind of do that more often. This stands for this, but he doesn't do that very often, right? Um, so he's not meaning to say, look, when you get to heaven, you're going to be standing in some long line and wait for your standard issue white robe. No, the white robe symbolizes something. And so there's this whole, and you, if you study this theme in, in, in the Bible, um, there's this whole theme of um, clothing metaphors, right? Jesus talks about this in the Gospels, about the wedding, and you know, he talks about wedding crashers, you know, in the Gospels. And uh, back in chapter 16, 15, there's a little uh, parenthesis there. It's almost like a tweet that Jesus gives in between these visions. Uh, See, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake and is clothed not going about naked and exposed to shame, right? Um, he's not talking about you literally having clothes. He's talking about morality. He's talking about ethics. Um, when you go back to the letters to the church of Sardis, Jesus speaking to the church says, some of you there have soiled your clothes, okay? Now, you know, my wife's a nurse, and, and, and you know, Jesus is not here talking about, you know, bedpans and people not being continent. He's talking about morality. He's talking about the righteous deeds of the saints. Okay, the second category is uh, animals. <clears throat> so how do we use animals symbolically? What are some examples of that? What? Mascots, okay, for like college mascots or high school mascots. 
a dove for peace. Okay. What? Gentle as a lamb. Uh, during political season, if you see a donkey or an elephant, right? We know exactly what that means. Um, you know, we're, we're used to icons. We're used to symbols and understanding those symbols in certain places. So if you see golden arches, for example, you think McDonald's. And it's the same way. Animals are often used uh, in a symbolic way in apocalyptic literature. So in Revelation, we have locusts right? You have a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is also a lamb, right? Which we'll look at in a minute. You have four horses of the apocalypse. You have a dragon. You have a beast. Um, it's kind of like, how many of you have ever had to read George Orwell's Animal Farm in high school or whatever, right? Where he uses animals as political symbols related to Russia. So if you don't know that, you kind of go, this is really a boring book. Um, can't figure that out. Um, the third category is numbers. So in apocalyptic descriptions, numbers rarely express a literal time frame or a mathematical equivalent, but more often designate a relative or general duration or symbolize a quality or idea associated with the number. Okay, so what are some numbers in Revelation? Seven, okay, that's the most common one, yeah. And so what is that, what is seven? Why seven? Completeness, okay. Yeah, not perfection, because the beast also has seven heads, right? But it's the, it's the idea of completion or fullness. Um, there's a good example of this in, um, in 1 Samuel. So some of you might be familiar with the story of Hannah. Um, she's barren, she is, she'll be the mother of Samuel, right? And she prays out to God, and, uh, and God fulfills her prayer, and she has a son, Samuel. And there's a poetic section in, in chapter 1 where she, she expresses just her joy, and she says, the barren has born seven. Okay, then a few verses later, there's narrative. It's not poetry, and it actually counts the kids up. How many are there? No, there's not seven. There's only six. All right? It's not a mathematical thing. It's she's full, she's complete. Did she literally have seven kids? No. All right? Genre, poetry, narrative, two different things. Okay? What's another number? Forty. Yeah, John doesn't use forty a whole lot, but that is a very common biblical symbolic number. Okay, three and a half. Okay, and that's actually used in in various forms, right? There's uh, uh, 1,260 days. Um, there's 42 months. Days, three and a half years. Um, there's a time, times, plural, and half a time, which comes from the book of Daniel, all right? These are all the same, period, right? Three and a half years. And it's a very traditional usage for the idea of the persecution of the people of God, okay? Apocalyptic literature is always a literature of crisis. It's always a literature related to the persecution of the people of God. So that's a very important clue. And so when you're looking at this number, you have to compare it to another number in Revelation, which is the millennium, right? Three and a half years of going through persecution compared to a thousand years of peace with Christ in the millennium, right? It's a relative kind of thing. Is he saying it's literally three and a half years? No. He's saying it's a short period of time compared to eternity. Uh, other numbers? Twelve. Did I hear twelve? All right, twelve. Okay, twelve is related to what? Twelve tribes, twelve disciples, right? 
Um, so 12 is a number that is related to the leadership of the community of faith. So then you could have multiples, right? You could have 12 times 12 equals 144 times 1,000 equals 144,000, right? In chapter 7. You could have 12 plus 12, and you have a group called the 24 elders in Revelation, right? And if you look, you know, at, at Revelation 21, where he talks about the New Jerusalem, he says it's built on the foundation of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, right? So he does give you some clues here and there about the meaning. Um, you have four living creatures. Four, four. <laughs> four living creatures, right? Four is a number of creation. Four is a number that relates to the created order because you have like four winds, you have four directions, um, you have a, a series of other kinds of fours that are all in some way related to the created order. So the four living creatures represent the wholeness of the creation, right? There's the, there's the eagle, there's the, the flying representation, there's domesticated animals, um, and then there's also the, the human face. Um, so again, this is very, very symbolic. Um, let me see, any other numbers we missed? Oh, there's one number, which we'll talk about later. Six, 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 right? Okay, so we always associate that with something not too positive. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about the interpretation of that. Okay, real quickly, before we take a break, the last category is traditional uh, apocalyptic symbols or prophetic symbols. So because Revelation stands chronologically towards the end of the period of apocalyptic literature, uh, John adopts many symbols which have become in the genre conventional for expressing certain ideas. Also because John sees himself as a prophet in the tradition of Old Testament prophecy, he reuses traditional prophetic symbols, metaphors, poetic hyperbole to express or illustrate his own visions. Some conventional symbols are a woman representing a people or a city, crowns symbolizing dominion or kingship, trumpets denoting voices, um, horns. Horns is very common in apocalyptic literature, uh, especially important in Daniel. Does anybody know what a horn symbolizes? Power, okay? The horn stands for power. So if you have a vision of Jesus who has seven horns, how do we translate that? Complete power, right? In theology, we'd say he's omnipotent. Um, seven eyes, eyes represent knowledge. Complete omniscience, right? Complete knowledge. Um, stars can represent angels. Uh, a sword represents authority. Uh, keys also represent. I have the keys of death and Hades, Jesus says, right? He has the authority over death and Hades. So earlier I read from chapter 14, and it talked about this nasty battle where the blood was up to the horse's bridle, right? And I think on your sheet there I have a quote. I don't have it on mine. Or I, have a, I have one of yours there. Um, underneath that section, they, the Romans under Hadrian, slew the inhabitants of Betar after, uh, after Bar Kosovo. This is an uh, early Jewish uh, messianic figure. Uh, Until the horses waded in blood up to the nostrils, and blood rolled along the stones of the size of 40 say and flowed into the sea a distance of four miles. Okay. When you read in Revelation about the blood is up to the horse's bridle, this is a very common image that you read in other apocalyptic sources. So he's not trying to say literally, wow, there's blood literally up to the horse's bridle. He's just saying, that really was a nasty battle. Okay? So change, understand the symbol for what it's trying to say. And this is, this is the biggest mistake people make with Revelation, is, is they just take, read it way too literally. And, and in that way, you're, you're misunderstanding his point. Um, okay, so we're going to 
uh, maybe during the break if you have time. <clears throat> There's some examples I put on your sheet there. Symbolism in other Jewish or Christian apocalypses. Um, what I'd like you to do is kind of underline or circle some things from the four categories we just looked at, right? Colors, symbols, uh, numbers, traditional apocalyptic literature, and then we'll look at those um, after the break. <clears throat>